Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, today. they don't care. They don't understand it. One second. All right. I am I am in charge of uh, uh, <laughs> par uh, uh, participants. Um, so we're going to jump right into uh, this, I would say, episode in our series of Don't Feed the Algae. Um, focusing on the sewage sludge issue. As you guys can see from the webinars we've hosted so far, so many of the issues that St. John's Riverkeeper um, uh, focuses on has a connection to algae blooms, to the growth of algae blooms, to the proliferation of algae blooms. And so what we do in this series is really try and connect those dots, connect those issues with this bigger issue so that we can all really understand how we can take part um, and, and playing a role in, in the solution. And, and that's really how to not feed the algae. Next slide. So to start off, St. John's Riverkeeper, in case you guys do not know, is a 501c3 nonprofit environmental advocacy organization. Um, our mission is to defend the St. John's River, River and advocate for its protection. And the way that we do that is by investigating pollution problems, advocating for policy changes, seeking solutions to those, educating the public, raising awareness, and then engaging, involving you guys, our members and citizens, the folks that are passionate about these issues. The, the threat of algae blooms and the reality of how they form, the policy solutions that are needed to take place and the ways that we can get people involved, that threads throughout every single one of these ways that we work together. And so thank you for joining this call today. Next slide. Um, and, and this webinar to better understand this issue and to help us with this work. So what we're gonna to cover today is first of all, just that bare level basic understanding of algae. And then we'll jump into the meat of the subject, which is uh, today's focus, which is sewage sludge. And then we're gonna end with what you can do, actions you can take and what's going on right now on the St. John's, how to not feed the algae. Next slide. So for some of these basics, understanding algae. The important thing to understand is that although um, uh, naturally, nitrogen and phosphorus are a part of our ecosystem and a part of our water column. Excessive uh, uh, inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus um, in excessive quantities with the right conditions is what is going to form an algae bloom. And unfortunately, because of um, the amount of pollutants that we have in the St. John's River coming in, we, we pretty much are always ripe with the, the quantities, the excessive quantities of nitrogen and phosphorus for a bloom. But what is different is that seasonally, we have the right amounts of sunlight. We have the warmer temperatures. And when, when wind and, and rain and all these things form that perfect storm, you could say, of conditions, we end up seeing those summertime algae blooms. Um, some algae blooms are naturally occurring and others are harmful. And the way that we find out whether it's a, an algae bloom that's naturally occurring or harmful is either by being very well versed in knowing how to visibly see the difference um, or through testing. And so um, either way, it's important, next slide, to stay away from these algae blooms um, because of the health risk that is associated with them. The most important thing that we can do to prevent these algae blooms, you know, right off the bat is just stopping pollution at its source. So while we focus on a lot of the, um, uh, you know, the health implications, how to avoid exposure, and then of course reporting, testing, and monitoring, the focus of a lot of St. John's Riverkeeper's work is how do we actually stop the excessive amounts of nutrients from reaching the water in the first place but on top of that, we have to, to keep in mind that we are in a place where we do have nutrients in the river. Um, and so the, the right conditions is gonna allow us to see it visibly. And so we should stay away. Next slide. The reason um, and the ways that we need to stay away is because the health impacts of, um, uh, of uh, coming into contact uh, with an algae bloom um, are, are, are very versatile. 
first of all, um, try to avoid ingestion. And that may sound crazy, but if you're out in a boat and you're water skiing, the chances of water coming in contact with your mouth is um, pretty high. And so that's why if you see an algae bloom, you should be avoiding um, water sports and water contact in that way. In addition, inhalation. And so those of us that are out on the river, maybe um, running or rowing or kayaking when you have that exertion that causes you additional inhalation, um, that's also a time that if you're seeing any sort of level of algae, you wanna avoid it. There's also um, been a link to long-term neurological issues. Um, we studied that or um, talked about that a little bit more broadly when we aired the film uh, Toxic Soup. And so if you wanna um, uh, find out more about some of those issues, you can check out that film. Um, you also wanna make sure that this isn't just uh, human impacts, um, impacts to uh, our pets um, is a concern. Uh, and then additionally, as a, a human, if you're ingesting fish from an area where you've seen visible algae blooms, that's gonna be another thing that um, we wanna attempt to avoid at this time. Next slide. So sewage sludge is gonna be the topic today. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa Reinemann, your St. John's Riverkeeper to continue the presentation. I wonder if I unmute myself. Um, thank you, Shannon, I appreciate that introduction. And, and for those of you who may have heard us talk about this subject, um, this is a new obsession. Um, of ours, and, and one of the reasons being that this is a new source of significant nutrient pollution on the St. John's. Um, in addition, it's permitted, so it's a permitted source. This isn't something that's accidental or something that's old and legacy. This is permitted by the DEP, um, and, and a lot, the majority of sewage sludge that's being exposing our river to this excess nutrients is actually coming from South Florida. So it's not even generated within our watershed. And so it, it is a major insult to those of us that are trying to reduce pollution in the St. John's. Um, so thank you for tuning in for this so we can talk more about it and understand what we can do together to protect the St. John's River and quite frankly, all of Florida waters because this is something that should and can be avoided. Um, so here's the St. John's River watershed, actually St. John's um, Water Management District area. And so mostly everything in this area is the St. John's River watershed, except for the East Coast. The East Coast is the Matanzas and, and other waterways. But in this area down here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, Shannon, is that showing? Um, this is the headwaters of the St. John's. Um, and the very first lake of the series of lakes that make up the St. John's River is Blue Cypress Lake. Blue Cypress Lake has been long celebrated as one of the cleanest, most pristine lakes in the state of Florida. In fact, it's been used as a baseline because historically it was so, um, so pollution-free. It was like a natural background as a Florida lake, clear lake should be. Um, and unfortunately, that all changed significantly over the past years. And so we went from having a lake that was celebrated for um, it being so pollution free to one that had toxic blue green algae, just like we're seeing in more areas in the lower St. John's. And so that was quite a shock to many of us who have been following and celebrating Blue Cypress Lake is what a Florida light lake should look like. So we started investigating what was leading to this 2000 um, uh, 18 outbreak in Blue Cypress Lake. And quite quickly found that there had been a large introduction of sewage sludge disposal on land next to Blue Cypress Lake. As we started digging in, we realized it wasn't only along Blue Cypress Lake, there was a significant increase in sewage sludge disposal in the headwaters of the St. John's. And so this is an area that obviously impacts the entire St. John's River. So what is sewage sludge before we get started? Um, sewage sludge is a byproduct of wastewater treatment. So when we send domestic sewage, I've lost my pointer, we send our sewage to the wastewater treatment plant for before they can discharge their effluent to the, the waters, to the river or to the creek or wherever they discharge, 
they have to clean out all of the waste and all this all of the the byproducts and so they, they send out the water and that creates sludge that's a concentrated human waste um, not only is it human waste a lot of times there's industry waste that's commingled it is treated somewhat by industry but there's still heavy metals and other th industrial waste that's commingled in the sewage sludge and so there's different ways of treating sewage sludge and they take out some of the um, of the heavy metals and some of the contaminants but not all of them it's considered um, class b as a certification but they come at, come up with a fancy name called biosolids it magically turns it into something that can be reused um, they spent millions of dollars on the name biosolids so it wouldn't sound so quite frankly gross and harmful um, but it's still sewage sludge and it's not fully treated and it's being disposed of in large amounts on our waterways and we're seeing significant nutrient pollution runoff into the St. Johns River and other waterways. Um, in preparation for today, I, you know, we've been focusing for this conversation and for our work on the nutrient pollution runoff because there is significant signals that we're seeing um, spikes in specifically phosphorus that's fueling the 2019 blooms. Um, but I wanted to look, there's other contaminants that are part of sewage sludge. And so I just Googled on, on the EPA website about health concerns, and they said there's, there's no documented scientific evidence that there's a problem with public health, but additional scientific work is needed due to persistent uncertainty. So there's persistent uncertainty even to the health risk associated with this land disposal practice. So let's get back to the St. Johns River. Um, this is a map of permitted sites where farmers can dispose of sewage sludge on their land. And if you see the red arrow there, this is just east of Blue Cypress Lake where we saw that huge outbreak of, of, of blue green algae in 2008. And all of these dots represent more than 70% of the, the sewage sludge that's produced in the state of Florida. So there's a huge amount of sewage sludge that's being transferred or trucked to the headwaters of the St. John's for disposal. You may ask why there's no permitted sites in South Florida. Well, the legislature passed special protections for South Florida to protect the Everglades due to a high runoff of phosphorus and blue-green algae in Lake Okeechobee. And so when they passed special protections for South Florida, they also approved a fee that utilities could charge in South Florida to literally truck their sewage sludge to a nearby site where they could legally dispose of it. And what we're seeing is the majority of South Florida sewage sludge is being trucked to the headwaters of the St. John's, which undermines the St. John's River health all the way up to Jacksonville. So here's back to our watershed map. If you look in the headwaters area, the, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, they actually permit this practice and they permit over more than 89,000 tons of sewage sludge annually to be dumped in this area. And we know it has a high runoff potential. There's more data coming in every day and this permitting process is flawed. Not only do we know it's flawed, the, de the Department of Environmental Protection admits that the permitting process is flawed but unfortunately, after a series of technical advisory committees, rulemaking, legislative actions, they still have not fixed this bad rule and they're still trying to permit more land disposal sites. So while we have sewage sludge throughout the watershed, we'll talk about in a minute, the majority of Florida's um, sewage sludge is being dumped in this three county area of Brevard, Indian River, and Osceola. And what happens there is a snowball effect. Um, there are things in the St. John's that there, there are regulatory tools within the St. John's called BMAPs or a Basin Management Action Plan. There's not one in the headwaters, even though there should be, um, but there is one in the Middle St. John's River, uh, the Middle St. John's River BMAP. So this is a plan to reduce pollution in the middle basin of the St. John's. But if you look at that 
regulatory tool, it requires a more than 90% reduction of phosphorus in the headwaters. So the only way this, this BMAP can help the middle basin reduce their toxic blue-green algae and, and nutrient pollution is to have a reduction of phosphorus and nitrogen in the headwaters of the St. John's, 90% reduction. Unfortunately, DEP is permitting more degradation with this large amount of sewage sludge. If you look at the lower St. John's River Basin Management Action Plan, it depends on a middle basin reduction of sewage sludge. So local counties have spent, in the state, have spent millions of dollars on the middle St. John's River BMAP reductions as well as the lower, but they're, they're set up to fail because we're permitting, the state is permitting large amounts of sewage sludge in the headwaters, undermining not only the health of the St. John's River downstream, but also undermining public investment. We're basically throwing good money after bad because there's no way for this investment to be successful due to the degradation in the headwaters. Um, this is a chart that was presented by the St. John's River Water Management District to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection last year. And what it shows you is that the red line is the mean phosphorus um, concentrations combined from 2003 to 2017. And then if you look at that compared to the blue line, which is the mean concentration in 2018, you see that there is a significant increase from Melbourne, which is in Brevard County in the headwaters, all the way up to the St. John's. I mean, I'm sorry, to Jacksonville. So what we're seeing a significant phosphorus increase um, throughout the St. John's River beginning in the headwaters. And so it was no surprise last year in 2019 when we had more than 90 days of toxic blue-green algae in the St. John's River, and it was a type that was fueled by excess phosphorus. And so this is a, a growing problem with, with very little relief in sight today. So as we mentioned, not only does it undermine the health of the St. John's River, it undermines public investment that's already been made. It also creates a significant annual cleanup liability of up to $200 million for all the counties downstream from this practice. This figure was developed from a formula that was presented to the Blue Green Algae Technical Advisory Committee. And so it's a defendable number, which should con concern all of us, whether you're concerned about environmental degradation or you're concerned about the viability of investing public dollars, because this creates a significant liability and it's being driven by South Florida's pollution, not even localized pollution. So now you probably know why I get so agitated by this, because it's permitted, it's being trucked up from South Florida, it's not being generated in the St. John's River watershed, and it threatens investment, it threatens and undermines the health of the river, and it's a public health risk because it's fueling these toxic blue-green algae blooms that we've been talking about. So what needs to be done? Um, one that is very simple is that we need equal protections for all of Florida waters. South Florida waters should not have extra protections that puts every other waterway at risk and puts every citizen that lives in the St. John's River watershed at risk. We simply need the same protections. Our waters need the same protections that South Florida waters have. Um, we also need a moratorium on sewage sludge land disposal. We know this is a problem. It's well documented by the state agencies. And fortunately, Indian River County has put a moratorium there around Blue Cypress Lake. So at the county level, they put a moratorium so you won't see this black sludge being dumped along Blue Cypress anymore. Um, but we need that throughout the state because this is a problem that once the soil is saturated, it takes decades to un undo. And then third, we need pilot projects to implement new technologies. That we have produced waste. We have sewage in the state of Florida. As we take septic tanks offline and we put them onto wastewater treatment facilities, we have more sewage. And so we do need a long-term sustainable solution. And there are new technologies out there that can manage this crisis. 
In fact, Jim DeRocher, who I believe is with us today, emailed us to ask about um, the Janicki process. There has actually um, been many meetings. In fact, there was a sewage sludge symposium um, two, uh, a year ago. In fact, they gave out these little emojis as part of the fun. Um, but they actually looked at these new technologies. But the, but the problem is the utilities are blocking that moving forward because right now, when the utilities put this sludge on a truck and it's, it's off their property, it's out of their hands. You know, it's out of sight, out of mind. These new technologies take investment and, and they, they take buy-in from the group. There is a, our Headwaters Advisory Council um, in Indian River County and Brevard County that we work with, they have been working with elected officials to get pilot projects because we have to have a path forward and that is one of the path forwards. And the new technologies, they take sewage sludge and they turn it into something useful. And so instead of trying to figure out where we dispose of this sludge, they actually process it and use it to create biofuels. And so it's something that's being done in other areas that we're behind the curve and we need to get our act together or we as well as future generations are going to pay the cost. And so I wanted to end on, on this slide is, you know, the state of Florida is growing dramatically. And if you notice the top areas is growing is Miami-Dade, Broward, Hillsborough, Orange County, Palm Beach. These are all areas that have special protections. And so as population is growing in South Florida, that means they're going to produce more sewage sludge. It has to go somewhere. And right now, the majority of it's coming to the St. Johns River for where they're closest. So this is a growing problem that we have to fix now. And, and there's actually, as we speak, we're tracking and trying to prevent a permit in Putnam County on Crescent Lake. Crescent Lake, Crescent Lake is actually impaired for phosphorus. So this is irresponsible to have a permit on this site, this lake, they would add more pollution, and it currently has a toxic blue-green algae bloom. And so why we would continue this practice, I don't understand, but that's why we need to work together, not only with all of us within the St. John's River watershed, but across the state to stop this practice, or we're going to saddle future generations with pollution as well as expensive cleanup costs. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon to talk a little bit more about how we can report um, and engage on this. And then we'll talk at the end about your questions on sewage sludge as we continue to work together to stop this harmful threat to the St. John's. Shannon? Well, thank you, Lisa. I think as you guys can see, um, you know, a lot of our work has a very direct impact on um, uh, the growth of algae blooms, but I think sewage sludge is just one of those that we've been tracking, Lisa has been tracking and, and um, really working heavily on for, uh, for, for several years now, but it quite frankly did lead directly to the, um, the 2019 algae bloom. And um, I wanna talk about how we first found out about that algae bloom uh, through people who reported it um, and, and um, highlight that because this is, it is really important for us to know where we're seeing the algae blooms um, and also to report it because um, if our uh, state leaders are seeing heavy reporting um, in South Florida, then they're going to continue to think that algae blooms are a South Florida problem that needs South Florida solutions. But we know that these are statewide problems that need statewide solutions. So reporting throughout is important. Next slide. Um, so uh, what we do at St. John's Riverkeeper is every single time uh, someone sends us an image of what they're seeing, uh, you know, on their back dock, whether it's a question or um, a, a definite algae bloom, is um, we can uh, uh, see that, identify it, and then make sure that it's also getting reported to um, the, the Florida State DEP, which is tracking this more broadly, and then doing the, the actual testing. We can follow up and see if that actual testing occurred. And in times when the testing did not occur, we ourselves can send people out to either take pictures um, uh, or just let people know where um, blooms have been seen. Um, and so these are some of the images that we've uh, seen so far in 2020. Um, one from Plumbers Cove, which is like a, a, a 
St. John's County and uh, uh, Clay County, Duval County area, that sort of um, uh, where those three counties all come together on the river, and then also um, in Sanford. So we have seen reports throughout the really a, a, a huge stretch of river. Next slide. This is where you're going to be able to find out more comprehensively where not only reporting has um, uh, occurred, but then when the where the DEP has gone out to do the sampling. Um, this this website is phenomenal. You can click on every single one of those little dots on the map there, zoom in, find out um, what the test results were, um, whether or not the test results were toxic, um, uh, you know, where the sample took place, an image of the water near the sample site, and then the, um, the different color views there are um, uh, the, uh, whether the testing occurred 90 days ago, 60 days ago, or within the last 30 days. The blue dots, and I know it's hard to sort of see here, but of, of, of course I want you guys to visit this website. It's, um, uh, I just type in FDEP and algae blooms and it's, uh, the dashboard is what comes up here. But this is where you can report to the DEP if you see an algae bloom, and then it's also where you can see the results of reporting. And again, what we really want to see here is that the dots on this map are comprehensive for the entire state of Florida and not um, uh, looking heavily at just South Florida because we know that algae blooms are happening on the St. Johns River um, uh, uh, and not just in South Florida, which, which has been getting you know, a, a lot more of the attention since the red tide outbreak um, uh, last year. Next slide. So the ways to report, I want everybody to definitely report to the FDEP first. That website, the dashboard that you just saw is going to be where the most comprehensive um, amount of, of information exists on algae blooms. Um, if you're looking for recreational information, you're about to go boating this weekend and you want to see where algae blooms um, have been spotted and whether or not they tested positive or not, that's going to be your, your place to go and you can see the website right there. But additionally, if you're willing, I'd love for you to let us know what you're seeing as well so that we can follow up. The FDEP is not going to test every single um, uh, image or report that was made by the public. You know, they use their own judgment, uh, the uh, quantity of reports that have come in, as well as their own um, staffing capacity and things to decide when they're going to go out and how they're going to go out and when where um, testing is going to occur. So if you can send it to me as well, then I can help to track those reports and see where um, uh, where we're seeing reports and where testing is actually occurring. And this is just a list of some of the things that are helpful for me in that, um, as well as an image, which is always the most helpful thing with algae blooms. Send me a picture of what you're seeing, right? Not just, you you know, uh, um, a comment that you've seen some green things on the water um, because there's a lot in, in the image that helps to, to understand what, what we're looking at as well as daytime location. Next slide. Also, if you're willing, um, so we, I talked earlier about um, the importance of being safe and avoiding coming into contact with algae blooms, and that is definitely the case. But what we've done with some people who either live waterfront or um, maybe are familiar with how to avoid um, uh, exposure, um, they've gotten trained to find out how to actually go sample algae blooms and then use um, what we have our, our strips to determine whether or not there is a, a toxic component to that algae bloom or not. Based on getting trained with us and then helping us um, to disseminate, as you guys can see from the map, we have volunteers throughout the watershed that can quickly go out and do that kind of testing. It helps us to decide whether or not we should ourselves take that sample to the lab because that's an expensive process. And so if that strip can tell us, yes, this is toxic, then it helps us to know that we should um, uh, potentially proceed with going to the lab as well, especially if we're not seeing the DEP um, out there testing simultaneously with our volunteers and our testers. Next slide. Um, this is just a, a, a quick plug for ways to also continue to learn how to um, not feed the algae, and that is our River Friendly at Home series that our Middle Basin um, Education and Outreach Coordinator um, does. Every Friday we have a new video. This Friday the focus is on fertilizer. If you missed our fertilizer webinar, Being River Friendly, you can find the recording for that in the past, and if you want to see um, Gabby's uh, a quick video um, talking about 
about uh, fertilizer at home and what we can all do to not feed the algae, then tune in on Friday and hear more about that. Next slide. Last, um, I, I just have to um, plug that St. John's Riverkeeper is a membership-based organization. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today and tuning in, but I really wanna thank those of you um, that have invested in our work and invested in, in our advocacy, as well as our, our um, uh, outreach work like these webinars. Um, our members are, are really the, um, uh, the, the, the oomph uh, behind our voice uh, and help us to be stronger. And so thank you all for being a member. And if you want to become a member now, that would be great. We have several different levels and um, would love for you to visit the website um, and, and uh, uh, invest in us in that way. If you don't want to become a member, you can also invest in some neat swag. Uh, you can see our Don't Feed the Algae shirt there um, and Lisa's hat that she is uh, modeling today. Um, uh, we don't often try to uh, focus on the algae colors in, in our stuff, but these two pieces of merchandise um, really do showcase the color of that algae. So you can um, be able to talk about that in public. Next slide. And then last, um, I just want to uh, invite all of you before we jump over to um, uh, Q&A to our next episode. We're gonna be talking about um, the Akawaha River. Um, for those of you that don't know, there is a dam on the Akawaha River uh, and freeing the Akawaha River from that dam is um, also a potential way to not feed the algae. Um, the uh, enhanced freshwater flow as well as some of the other you know great um, restoration benefits of that project feeds into this bigger campaign um, to prevent algae blooms on the river. So uh, with that I'm going to jump to um, uh, our questions from the chat window. If you have any feel free to um, submit them now and Lisa I'm going to um, ask this one to you. Uh, if you could talk about who approved the moratorium on Blue Cypress Lake. Yeah, excellent question. Um, that was actually a local moratorium put in place by Indian River County. So it was the Indian River County Commission. And they have been extremely active with trying to get long-term solutions. Um, their county commission hired experts to help, you know, demonstrate the degradation that was going on in Blue Cypress. They participated in the, um, in the technical advisory committee that DEP put up. So I really want to applaud the Indian River County Commission, um, as well as our Headwaters um, Advisory Council members that worked with them. Brevard County put in a moratorium to prevent any new sewage sludge permits. And so they have a moratorium as well, so there can't, won't be any new permits in the area. Um, and as I mentioned, there is a new one that we're tracking on Crescent Lake that hasn't been noticed yet, but stay tuned. We'll be, um, um, we're working trying to prevent it before it gets there, but if they notice it, we'll be, um, we'll let you guys know how you can engage to prevent that from happening. We had another question from the chat window. Is there a way for volunteers to, as, to assist either with our advocacy or with um, some of our more technical advisory, um, us, I guess, help <laughs> counsel our technical advisory councils? Most definitely. We're always looking for expertise to work with us. Um, you know, we, we've been working on this for two years with our Headwaters group and our members are located in Brevard and Indian River County because that's sort of where the the bulk of this was going, but as you can see by the, the prosperous uptake or increase that it is watershed wide. And so this is something we need to work on throughout the watershed. Um, the Blue Green Algae Task Force um, that the, the state put together, they have not met this year. We hear rumor that they are gonna meet in July and they committed to taking up this issue at their, um, when they meet again. And so that's something now it'll be, you can participate in that virtually. Um, and so as soon as we hear about that, we're actually meeting with the chief scientist on Thursday. We'll ask him when that meeting will be, but that's a great forum to speak up for all of Florida waters on this practice. Um, and then we will, we are currently working with the legislature to, to truly do something that's protected this next session. So there'll be different phases of opportunities for advocacy. Um, that we'll keep you abreast of, as well as if you have technical expertise, um, feel free to email me at lisa at stjohnsriverkeeper.org. 
um, let us know and, um, and we'll tap, tap you in. We do have a team that's looking at new technologies. So if new technologies is something you're interested in, um, we can um, hook you up with some of our technical experts that are looking at that. So just contact us and um, it takes an army to make a difference. So we welcome anyone's engagement that's willing to participate. And Lisa, I think you know firsthand that sometimes people get real passionate about this poop issue. And so yeah. if you fall into that category, want to help us explore new technologies or um, participate in some of these statewide conversations about um, sewage sludge, then we definitely could, could uh, use the support. So that would be great. Um, I have a question about the role of the health department in some of these issues. Um, has the health department been supporting Education, uh, educated, sorry, educating people on um, some of the risks associated with sewage sludge. You know, that's that they have not been engaged to date. Um, you know, they are engaged somewhat, but we would wish more regarding harmful. You know, from the blue green algae, um, and that's something the health department was engaged in the blue green algae task force and had committed to do more signage, you know, around boat ramps and, and more awareness. But that, that's been a real disconnect that we've seen over the years, specifically with blue-green algae and with, um, and with sewage sludge, quite frankly. For example, during the technical advisory committee, I, I don't remember the health department being a part of that unless they were just monitoring. Um, but it is something that is a significant health risk that they should. So, not to date from our advocacy, but that is something we should reach out to them because it is a direct link to the toxic blue green algae, which they are part of the discussion. Lisa, any final um, comments for everyone before we log off today? Yeah, I, you know, I think the one thing I, I don't want to be discouraging, um, you know, because this, you know, a lot of times when we get together, we're talking about the threats, but I do want to leave everyone that we can make a difference if we work together. Um, and if we report, if we engage, you know, the more of you that helps us have eyes and ears on the water so we can alert people to this and then stand up for the St. John's, um, you know, when they're having discussions. Last year during the Blue Green Algae Task Force meetings, they were solely focused on South Florida. And so we went to every meeting and talked about the St. John's. And so they, they added the St. John's River into their discussion, committed to deal with sewage sludge, but it just takes that consistent mm -hmm. persistence to make sure that we're giving the St. John's River a voice. So thank you all for tuning in and, and your willingness to be part of the solution. And we look forward to continuing to work with you guys that we know so well. And also we look forward to meet, to working with some of the folks um, that are new to this process in the discussion, but thank you for tuning in today. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thanks to everyone. We hope that you join us on Wednesday, July 8th for our Free the Aquawaha discussion or check out the website to see any of our um, uh, previously recorded webinars on the topic. And uh, everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.